Yay Networks. I've always been that person. I'm like the detective of like just trying to like piece it all together. Yeah, yeah. And I know so many people aren't that way, but I'm I am like, definitely that way for like, sure. I need <laughs> yeah. to make sense or try to make yeah. sense of something you'll never make sense of. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Happily Ever Amber podcast. I am so excited. I have a badass woman on my podcast today, and her name is Kimberly Shannon Murphy. And yes, although we are going to be talking about some childhood trauma, um, and it's it's very, very heavy, so this might be a little bit of a trigger warning, but for those who have suffered from childhood abuse, um, or know someone in their family, um, this is the episode for you to understand how surviving works, how you heal and how you grow. And Shannon does such an incredible job in this book explaining, and I'm super excited to dive into this episode and have a discussion with her. For those of you who have been watching or listening, we've been talking when we decided to hit record because we're talking about good shit. So um, we're rolling. We're no. rolling. This is rolling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what were we? We were talking about how trauma comes up, how your memories come up, how your memories come up. Okay. So let's start from the beginning. Um, where do you feel comfortable starting? Let's just start wherever you feel like. Wherever you would like to start, I think our memories start to come up more when we speak our truth, when we start really looking at what our truth is. And for me, it was connecting with my inner child. Mm -hmm. And once I did that and she felt safe with me and I removed us from unsafe situations, she showed me more. Mm. And like to your point, I've been there too and am kind of there right now where I'm like, okay, how much do I need to actually know? Like. Mm. Do I need to know all of the things to move on and heal? Which the short answer is no, I don't think you do. But I think that there are really – the big things are important to remember because it all comes back to why we behave in certain ways. And if we can connect those reasons, mm -hmm. then we can heal them and not project them onto our children and onto relationships in our life and attract – people that we don't want in our life as right. well. Right. And it also shows up in other ways, even though if you you don't necessarily feel like, okay, that happened, you know, for instance, like I was touched inappropriately in the second grade and I'll never, never forget that moment. But like, do I really need to digest it? Well, the answer is, yeah, science shows us if we don't, if we don't at least acknowledge it, mm -hmm. right, and we don't say hi to it, right, and, and sit with it for a second – then it's going to come up in other ways, and that might be in, in health issues. Completely. I mean, I'm very close with Gabor, and he's become yeah. a friend and my mentor, and that's his teaching, right, is that if we don't get in touch with our truth and get in touch with our authentic self, it does manifest itself in illness at mm. some point in our life. And I do believe that because – my family is an intergenerational trauma mm -hmm. family, mm -hmm. and I'm watching it play out in all of the family members in my life, right. my aunts, my uncles, my sisters, my parents. So yeah. I can see there is so much truth to what he's saying Absolutely. and also science behind it as yeah, well. Yeah, and you see your family members and you hope that like – they'll come to you, right, That the healthy person that you've now become, and they'll get guidance. And isn't that such a blessing to know that you can at least help them on their path, their their journey, or at least put them in the right direction to healing if they choose to do so. If they choose to do so. If they choose to do so. And a lot of people don't want to. Most oh, people don't. It takes a lot of courage. So let's start from the very beginning. Okay. Of today or no, I'm kidding. <laughs> what time did you wake up? What time did your kids wake you up? Um, uh, no, let's start from the beginning yeah. of your life. So at two years old, I don't want to tell your story for you. That's I okay. want you to tell you because it's this is your story. Yeah. Um, my maternal grandfather, my mother's father was, and Dr. Romney has basically diagnosed him just through 
the stories and mm -hmm. my memories. And that's been super helpful for me because mm -hmm. I didn't have a name to any of this when I was sort of going through it and then having my memories and my flashbacks. I don't think I ever actually forgot what happened to me. Um, I think that it was just being accepted that this is what my family was and mm -hmm. all the adults in my life were neglectful, including mm -hmm. my parents, obviously number one, my parents. Um, and he was a sociopath and, um, you know, groomed me from the time I was two. But mm -hmm. I also feel like I was kind of ungroomable. It's not a word. It's a word I'm making up for myself. Yeah. Um, in the sense of I had a really strong spirit since I came into this world and always knew that there was something really wrong about everything that was happening and wasn't afraid to voice it and talk about it even when no one was listening. When did you start – when did you come to your mom and say, listen, like, I don't I don't want to say grandfather because he doesn't deserve that in my opinion. Um, him, we'll just call him, him – you know, is touching me inappropriately. It's super interesting because for a long time, I never wanted to call him my grandfather. I was always like, I'm going to call him him or I'm going to call him my mother's father. Or, yeah. And then I realized that I was actually doing myself a disservice by not calling him my grandfather oh. because I think that it takes away from the truth of the relationship that was should have been and was supposed to be. So yeah. I actually do call him my grandfather. Now yeah. I do. It took me a while to get there. I was 15 when I first said to my mom, I'm having these flashes and things of something happening to me. Mm -hmm. And I did not know at the time that she was also experiencing the same thing, that she was having her memories. She was 40 at the time. And wow. – she like freaked out when I told her and then – You were watching TV, right? You were yeah. watching a TV program because I think it's really important for some people to realize that it comes out in other ways and it could just be maybe a memory that you have or for, like for you, mm -hmm. you were watching a TV program and – I was watching a Lifetime movie, um, which I feel like many trauma <laughs> survivors watch Lifetime. <laughs> so that's all I did with my mom, you know, at, at night and stuff and there oh. was a woman – who was experiencing flashbacks. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's happening to me. Like, that's what is going on. Mm -hmm. And because I grew up in such an unsafe environment and because every adult was just complicit and didn't, you know, um, do anything about what he was doing, I didn't feel safe to tell anybody. So in that moment, it felt like, oh my gosh, I'm not crazy. This is not okay. Oh, You're yeah. watching somebody else go through it. And so it gave me the courage to tell my mom. Mm. And your mom's reaction, talk about that for a second because I find that really, really fascinating. I yeah. mean, as a mother, you're a mother obviously, mm -hmm. and that's I, – I can't – but he had already passed at this time, he right? He had passed. He had passed, so. He died when I was 11, and my mother – can disassociate like nobody's business and you can kind of – you can see it when it's happening. If you talk to her about something difficult, she completely leaves her body. It's, she's like mm. a shell of a human. And But that's a trauma response. Totally, yeah. trauma response. And going back to us not, you know, how much do we need to know and do we need to – that's exactly a perfect example because mm. here I was needing my mother in such a huge way mm. to show up for me and – he was gone, and in that moment, she couldn't show up for me. She completely disassociated, ran out of the room, came back in, and was like, you're going to see my therapist tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you have a therapist? I had no idea. What is she going to do? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, if you can't save me, what is a therapist going to yeah. do? Yeah. And it, at that moment, I just needed my mom. I needed yeah. her to just validate me and just hug me or be there, and she just couldn't do it. And so – I remember kind of following her into her room and just, you know, mom, what, you know, did, and she said something happened to me too. And I was like, what? Because at that time I didn't really have a face to who it was. I kind of just had like figures in my head. Mm. And I think that came from years of suppressing, having to suppress what was going on because it was okay. And it was just what my family did. Yeah. It felt maybe normal in a way? It never felt normal to me, but it was normalized. Normalized, okay. So it was normalized by every adult in my life. So at some point, 
when you're a kid and you have to have attachments to survive your childhood mm -hmm. and these are the people who you have to have attachments to, you just sort of have to like put it in a place in your head to make sense of it. And so I think I just put everything in compartments just to survive what was happening. Mm -hmm. What about your sisters? Because I imagine, you know, I have two sisters and sometimes obviously with siblings, you go and you can find it in your siblings, whereas you wouldn't necessarily because you're, you know, afraid of your parents' reactions or how they'll respond or getting in trouble, right, for maybe outing someone or being curious about something. So mm -hmm. did you, did you ever go to your sister's? My one sister who's older than me um, suffered a lot of it as well. Mm -hmm. And so it was just this enmeshed family that was just basically all groomed by this man. And I feel like we were all sort of living in this toxic bubble of shame and pain and confusion. Mm -hmm. I'm When you're saying that, I think of – God, what happened? Did you ever dive into what happened to your grandfather that made him – like, do, do you go back in your lineage and, and see where it possibly could have started? Yeah. I'm, I've am i always been that person. I'm like the detective of like just trying to like piece it all together. Yeah. Yeah. And I know so many people aren't that way, but I'm I am like, definitely that way for like, sure. I need yeah, to yeah. make sense or try to make yeah. sense of something you'll never make sense of, right. which is also a reality too. But – he was definitely abused. I mean, there's no way that he wasn't. They would tell stories jokingly of him mm. hiding under the sink every time like a certain uncle would come over. That's right. I remember that. I remember that in the book. So, but, you know, for me, I'm like, I don't, you know, there's no, yes, there could have been, there could have been a reason why he was the way he was, but yeah. I don't. You have to make pieces of like, you know, how to take care of yourself. Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. Guys, sometimes I don't freaking want to cook. Okay, let's just be real. London's not doing her homework. Riley's playing volleyball. And the last thing that I want to do is make my kitchen a mess and cook. And that is why I need to tell you about Factor. Guys, these are two-minute meals. That's so fast. You could have pancakes, smoothies, and so many different other varieties. There's no prep. There's no mess. It's flexible for your schedule. You don't have to like plan, okay, I'm gonna be in the kitchen for an hour. Um, it's, it's just such a great option for busy people. So sign up and save, okay? We've done the math. Factor is less expensive than takeout, takeout, which is definitely a problem. This is quicker and easier than takeout. So head over to factormeals.com slash HEA50 and use code HEA50 to get 50% off. That's code HEA50 at factormeals.com slash HEA50 to get 50% off. Speaking of Glimmer, your amazing book um, that I read and I love so much, um, what inspired you to write it? I always wanted to write a book and knew that that's what I was meant to do with all of this. Mm -hmm. um, and when COVID hit, I just don't do well, like sitting still. And I was like, I'm going to get a ghostwriter. And initially, I had been writing with my whole family. Like when I was, when we all sort of came out with our memories and mm -hmm. were discussing it together, we were all writing a book together wasn't really a book. It was more of like an exorcism of just us sort just of – Just like vomiting on a yeah. paper, on a diary of like yeah, – of yeah. what, what had happened to us and what mm -hmm. he did and all these things. And it – in at that time felt like it was a healthy thing, but in retrospect, it was actually really unhealthy to be processing something with my mother because mm. she often put herself in the same boat as me and we were never in the same boat because she was my mother – and she didn't protect me. How is her relationship with her mother? Sorry, that's really – this is like, you know, because your, gram, your yeah. grandmother obviously knew. My grandmother was a I, – I feel like she was just as bad as him. She mm. saw things and did nothing about it. Ugh. She was very – she – talk about a narcissist, like the biggest narcissist. Um, my grandfather was an architect, so he was successful and had money, mm -hmm. but – in actuality, never actually had his license. He was working under somebody else's 
name, so he never got his license. But I mean, so, but he know, was still operating as if he was an architect, but he wasn't. Which it's is like that Leo movie. Yes. What is that movie called oh, with Amy the, Adams? Um, and he's like a doctor. Sorry, I just went on a tangent. But and like pretend. Yeah. Yes. Pretends that. Yeah. Which just goes to show you another personality trait of his that he could like go, get up and go to work every morning and be this person and, and be okay and not even actually be that person. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, but he gave my grandmother everything she needed to look perfect on the outside, and that is literally all she cared about was, you know, she'd get her nails done, she'd get her hair done, everything, you know, she could throw a good party, she could make everything pretty, like that's all that mattered Mm -hmm. to her, which I think is a common trait amongst families like this and amongst narcissistic families, which I think when you have abuse like this in a family system, that narcissism is quite apparent and Mm -hmm. living. It's not work for everybody, but for me, my trauma was so deep that until I explored that, um, it's almost like the protectors go away and you're able to connect with the demons and the pain that you're not able to connect with in, I like to say, on this plane because you're definitely in another place when you're doing that work. Mm-hmm. And my first journey, I was able to reconnect with her mm. and realized that she was the only reason that I was here and that she literally fought for our lives and how strong she was. And so I'm actively reparenting her as I'm parenting my daughter every single day, literally. And it's really hard. Yeah. So speaking of your daughter, Capri, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, How old is she? She's nine. She's going to be 10 in May. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um. You talked about breastfeeding. I Mm. think this is really important for a lot of women, whether they, you know, because we have so much societal like pressure and Mm -hmm. I just, through my own personal of really bad breastfeeding experiences, Mm -hmm. like you just feel so much shame. And for you, who you didn't know, it it was a trigger for you. It became a trigger and and you were starting to have – Flashbacks, memories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Will you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and it's an actual thing, which I had to learn through just Googling it because I was so freaked out and not understanding why, you know, and that's the really how we're talking about do I need to remember everything? Do I need to know everything? It's like in you learn in these instances that, yes, you do in a lot of ways because otherwise you can't process it. And if you can't process it, then you can't heal it and get through it and it gets stuck. And so Mm -hmm. I was – pregnancy, the whole pregnancy and breastfeeding was difficult because because I had herpes and um, when I got pregnant because of my hormones, I was just like sick all the time. Mm -hmm. And so then I couldn't have a natural childbirth, which is what I wanted to have – So that happened. And then the breastfeeding, like the first time I breastfed her, I started having like really intense flashbacks. And so like I would get super anxious and I could see her getting super anxious. And it was a really difficult time for me. And I did it for a few weeks. And then I was just like, I'm not doing this to her because she can feel my energy. She can feel. Yeah. So I just started pumping and I did that for about four months. But um it was a really, really hard time. Yeah, and whether you're pumping or not, I mean, it's like I imagine – were you still having flashbacks yes. when you were pumping? Yeah, because yeah. it's the same – and it fucking sometimes hurts even more because those pumps are really powerful. Yeah, it's like it, like that cow sound is like yeah. real. They yeah. should change that and not have like the eh. – it should be more of like <laughs> – I don't know, some sort of like <laughs> Soothing, meditation. Yeah, like sound. 528 hertz something, it's like a, healing, yeah, healing like, vibrations. Yeah. So that, they that's should make that. Good. Yeah. They'd make a lot of money, I feel like. Um, yeah, I was still having the flashbacks while I was breastfeeding. And I was, like, forcing myself through it. And my husband finally was like, why don't we just go to the beach and you can try to breastfeed her again? And I was like, no, you don't understand. She had gotten to a point. And then I was so in my head about, like, look, I'm already, like, passing my trauma onto her. Like, I'm already doing it. And that was, like, yeah, yeah, devastating yeah. for me. Yeah. 
And he's like, no, but if we go to the beach and, you know, then I was like, no, you don't understand. She acts like he was away on a film for like the first month of her life. So he didn't see mm. that interaction. Mm. And the ocean is one of your triggers, right? Or wa- yeah, water? Yeah, water. Water. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we went to the beach and I was like, I'll try it. And, you know, it was like went to feed her and he's sitting there and he's like, you know, just try to relax. And it was a disaster. And she's like screaming like she's, you know, <laughs> and – He's like, okay, okay, I get it. Never mind. Like, you know. Yeah, yeah, And then he was kind of the one who was just like, it's okay to give her formula. And that – You're like, thanks, asshole. I yeah, know. Yeah, like I – yeah. <laughs> like I – you know, I – the whole point was – and I was like an overproducer, so I was making so much milk. So like oh my, my guilt was huge because I'm like, how can I not give her this milk? And then, in, you know, go on Instagram and you see these women who are just like out in the public and – And I love that that's their experience, right? but it's not everybody's experience. Yeah, that definitely wasn't mine. And honestly, sometimes I'm like, I wish I could have another baby just so I could like force them on my boob and I can walk around like the town and like, you know, drive with my, you know, I just, but that wasn't, that wasn't my journey. And that's just something that you have to accept. You're like, it's okay. Yeah, it is okay. And it's become such a thing in society. And I feel like it puts more shame on – you have no idea what someone's journey has been and why, yeah. you know. And some of those people who are so judgy about the breast – oh, you're not breastfeeding? Yeah. Like you're doing – you know, when they have no idea yeah. the reasons why and what you've been yeah. through. Yeah. So, you're yeah. just like, I'm sorry. Do you need a hug? Like because either I'm going to hug you or I'm going to punch you in the face. <laughs> yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, let's see. There's other things. Let's see. The breastfeeding. Oh, this was a good one. When you talked about parenting Capri, mm-hmm. um, I met – she knows, right? Isn't there – there was a little situation in the mm-hmm. family. Okay. Yeah. So how do you even – how do you explain that? Did you get guidance on how – No, I've never had guidance. <laughs> <laughs> never. I'm a guideless chi- child, <laughs> adult child. <laughs> Aren't we all? I'm a guideless adult human. Um. Yeah, and that's, again, going back to how it was manifesting in my family. It's, you know, everyone was so stuck on, we're not going to focus on the past and what happened. I'm like, yeah, but yeah. you guys are living it out. Like the the your choices, your behaviors, the things you're doing. There was a situation that happened with Capri. My husband was filming a movie in New York and we went and I knew that my sisters were all going to be there around the same time. And I was still talking to one of my sisters at the time. And so I said, you know, Capri would really love to see her cousins because she had started her. She was six at the time, I think. She had had a relationship with all of them. And my sister wrote, absolutely, we'll all, you know, meet up. And then, you know, thanks to social media, I knew they were there because they were posting, you know, we we were literally in the same town. And I was writing my sister and I got no response. And Capri, my mother was a part of that. My mother was there too. And Capri and my mother at that time were really close. And so Capri kept FaceTiming my mom and my mom just wouldn't answer her. And so she just turned around to me and was just bawling. And she's like, mommy, what did I do wrong? And I was like, in that moment is when I was like, I'm done with all of them. Yeah. Because here is my six-year-old thinking that she did something wrong because all of these fucked up adults don't want to look at their shit. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to be a part of that at all. Isn't that amazing, that point when you get, when something like that significant in your life happens and you just know enough is enough. Yeah. Because you try so hard sometimes to make it work. To be the better person. Mm-hmm. And then you just – then when your own child, then the mama bear comes out and you're yeah. like, fuck this. No way. Well, because they're so innocent too. So innocent. And it's exactly – for her, it was like, my cousins are all here. Why – what did mm-hmm. I do? And she also said to me, I've, I've – aren't I a good cousin, mom? Like, haven't mm-hmm. I always been a good cousin? And I'm just like, this is gross. And so I had to have that conversation with her like – Mommy's family is very hurt 
we've had a lot of pain in our family and not all adults choose to deal with their pain. And when they don't deal with their pain, this is what it looks like. And it has absolutely nothing to do with you. And I'm sorry that it's spilling on you. Mm -hmm. And then that's my choice. So now what do I do with that? Do mm -hmm. I stay in relationship with these people and let these situations keep happening? Where And then all of a sudden she's 15 and in the same place I was in because yeah. thinks that she did something wrong. So and she doesn't know no, – she doesn't know no, right, that you were touched, you know, for many years. You just She just knows that the, there's been generational trauma and this is why these adults are acting. Not. She knows my husband – you know, when that had happened, he said to her, she was very adamant. She's a really strong personality. And she yeah. was like very adamant about like, I want an example, mommy. Like yeah. you. Look at who her mom is. You <laughs> wanted to know. Yeah. She's like, I want an example. When something happens at school, you're always saying, give me an example right. of what happened. Oh, yeah. So Casey just said to her, you know how our number one job is to protect you. Mm -hmm. And she said, yes. And he said, mommy wasn't protected when she was a kid. And she was just like, who hurt you, mom? Mm -hmm. And I said, mean as dad. And she said, um, did he hurt you with his hands or did he hurt your heart? Mm -hmm. So I just said both. And she just hugged me and she's like, I'm so sorry, mom. Mm -hmm. And I just said, Capri, this is not about you. And I'm not going to let them hurt you anymore. Mm -hmm. Period. Yeah. Mm. And I think that that's like around the age too. It's got to be really hard because having having to raise two daughters myself in this, you know, in LA where it doesn't matter where where it is, but it, I think in bigger cities we're impacted more with just inappropriate behavior. Mm -hmm. So you have to teach kids younger. Like yeah. kids, girls are starting their periods younger. They're yeah. being sexually, you know, sought after younger by men on social media. So it's like, it's, it's, I can't imagine, um, I just, it's, it's, it's difficult. So I, I'm, I'm lost at words because your daughter is so lucky to have you. Thank you. And the work that you're doing is so incredible and it takes an immense amount of courage and strength and I just I commend you so much. You are such a beautiful woman. Thank you. Inside and out. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um I think we got everything. There's one more question. I know what my question was. What does happily ever after look like for you? Being able to enjoy what I created without all of them. Mm. And actually, Dr. Romney and I spoke about this yesterday about trauma bonds and family mm -hmm. and how I do believe that the relationship I had with my family was strictly trauma bonded, that there was no love there because how could you have love when it's all abuse? Mm -hmm. In every way, shape, or form that you're being treated is abusive and, and love is safety, not abuse. Mm -hmm. So I think that the one thing that society has to sort of shift from is, but it's your mom, but it's your dad. Yeah, because but that's they're how your sisters. we're, we're told. What that's what we're told. Yeah, that your family is your blood family, and that's not necessarily true. If you no. have those good relationships, great. But it's you know that I know that it's not true, mm -hmm. and I think so many probably other survivors of ancestral abuse mm -hmm. can relate. Yeah. Well, it, it takes a lot of – and it's not just about being – having courage and being strong because most days I don't feel very strong and most days I feel like I'm not 
raising her right and I'm, you know, and I react in certain ways that I get frustrated with myself, but it's all, I think, in the repair of it where I can go to her and say, sorry that mommy overreacted. It has nothing to do with you. It's my own stuff. You know, my parents never apologized to me for anything. So it's all about being able to connect with why did I react that way for absolutely no reason and letting them know that it has nothing to do with them and just trying to get better at that, um, yeah. you know, is, is difficult. One day at a time. Yeah. So where could everybody get your book and then where can they follow you on um, your socials? I only have Instagram. I, th- I mean, I actually – I do have everything, but I don't go on. <laughs> I, don't go. I don't participate it's, it's either. Too much. It's, it's too much. So many things. Um, but my Instagram is Kimberly Shannon Murphy Stunts, like the longest handle on the planet. Um, <laughs> and you know, I try to. It's kind of, and I say this to all my son friends. I'm like, sorry, you could totally unfollow me. <laughs> it went from like a stunt page to like you know this survivor of. Oh, but that's beautiful. Yeah. Why not? Yes, totally. Um, but I feel like it's – the books help so many people already. We are and will eventually make a film and that's sort of the – that was always my goal um, with it all. Mm-hmm. I think that it's a topic that people need to talk more about and mm-hmm. that there's so many people that are suffering in silence because it's almost like staying in that family unit and mm. staying in that space is super unsafe. And until you can get to a safe place with safe people around you, mm-hmm. you can't really actually start healing. And for those out there who are suffering and silent today, what programs, because there's just like, there's got to be programs out there. I know there is because I'm in a couple of programs myself. Um, but what are the programs that they can go to for where they could be amongst other survivors? I think there's still meetings, like there are SIA meetings. But for me, internal family systems is a great therapy. Um, it was started by Dr. Richard Schwartz, and it does parts therapy. And there's you can go on the website, and there's tons of different, like in every, so many people are. Different cities and different states. Yeah, okay, so where you can, can find therapists okay, that great. practice that. And EMDR is actually really helpful too. I just started doing EMDR with Dr. Amen. Yeah. Oh, you did? Yes. Oh, amazing. Yeah, we could talk about that after. That's the, amazing. After the podcast. Yeah. I love him, EMDR. That's, yeah. And I feel like that coupled with, like for me, my psychedelics, psychedelics? have been, oh. yeah. Shoot, we're going to have to talk about that too. Yeah, because you can't. I haven't can't, done that yet. Say it again. <laughs> I haven't done psychedelics yet. I'm scared, but I was really scared too. My first when Gabor had said it to me, I was like, absolutely not. I'm not going there. And yeah. it's changed my life. Like I've in the past two years, I've healed more than I've healed really? in my entire life. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the thank podcast. You for and me. um Yeah, you guys go go buy the book. It's amazing. It really is so beautiful. And then you have to see the film when they make it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Whew. Thank you so much to everyone who tuned into this episode. Um, I have so many thoughts running through my mind. I would love to hear from you guys for sure about what you thought about this episode, um, what you took out of it. For me, um, being a mother, um, also a, a survivor of my own personal trauma, I think that there is a glimmer of hope and that you, you have to know that you don't have to suffer alone. Um, And I think Kimberly does such a beautiful job and the fact that she's out here um, being so open and vulnerable about her past experiences of childhood abuse is, it takes such an incredible amount of strength and courage. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Kimberly, for coming on the podcast today. Um, And thank you everyone who continues to listen, watch, and share this podcast. That is how I will continue to grow and be able to have incredible people share their stories um, like Kimberly did today. So thank you everybody, and I'll see you next time. Yay Networks.